Hello, I'm Katie Broomfield, a researcher in the Department of History at Royal Holloway, University of London. Government Communications Headquarters, better known as GCHQ, is the government agency tasked with ensuring the security of UK official and military communications for the purposes of national security. The work undertaken at GCHQ has its origins in signals intelligence which began during the First World War. However, it was not until May 1983 that the intelligence role of GCHQ was publicly acknowledged. Between 1947, when GCHQ was established in its present form, and 1984, anyone employed at GCHQ was not only permitted but encouraged to belong to a national trade union, which most of them did. That is until 25th of January 1984 when without warning the government announced its decision that with immediate effect staff at GCHQ would no longer be permitted to belong to national trade unions. The announcement came as a surprise to the staff working at GCHQ, the unions to which they belonged and the Council of Civil Service Unions, the CCSU. As a result, the CCSU and six individual unionised members of staff sought judicial review of the Prime Minister's decision. I'm now joined by Dr David Juritich, a lecturer in law at Royal Holloway, University of London, to find out more about what's happened in this case. David, perhaps first of all you can explain exactly what is meant by judicial review. Well, a judicial review is, is a kind of hearing when you are asking the courts to review the lawfulness of a decision that's been made by a public authority or by a body exercising a public function. Now the key thing about a judicial review is the court is being asked whether the decision was lawful. It's not being asked about the merits of that decision. So, for example, uh, Lord Brightman explained in the Chief Constable of North Wales Police and Evans that judicial review is concerned not with the decision, but with the decision-making process. It is not an appeal from a decision, but a review of the manner in which the decision was made. So, in this case, um, the civil service unions are lodging a judicial review claim against a decision taken by the Prime Minister acting in her capacity as the Minister for the Civil Service. She is the public body whose functions are being exercised. On what basis did the applicant seek judicial review of the Prime Minister's decision that members of staff of GCHQ could no longer uh, belong to trade unions? So they argued that this was a breach of what we call a legitimate expectation. So they said that there was a long practice uh, and it was accepted and that there was a well-established practice of consultation between the unions and the Prime Minister and the government about important alterations to their working conditions um, and the conditions of employment of their members of staff. And so their argument was that the Prime Minister had ignored this past practice, that this past practice had given them a legitimate expectation that it would be followed in the future and it was unlawful for the Prime Minister not to consult them. And what did the Prime Minister say about that? Well, her perspective on this one was that it was necessary to secure national security that um, these changes were made. So she pointed out, for example, that GCHQ staff had taken industrial action, including one-day strikes and work to rule an overtime ban, on seven occasions between February 1979 and April 1981. And her argument was that this endangered national security given the nature of the work undertaken at GCHQ and the fact that if you think about it, it's the 1980s, there's a number of national and international security issues the Prime Minister and the government were concerned about. Um, and she was also worried that if she did notify intention to consult, that would lead to further industrial action and then in her view, further threaten national security. So how, how was the case decided? How were those arguments balanced? Well, initially in the High Court, um, the Council for Civil Service Unions won. Uh, they were victorious. 
in, in claiming that their legitimate expectation of consultation had been breached. Now the Prime Minister and the government um, then appealed that to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal agreed with, with the government's, um, government's decision on this and then it ended up finally in the House of Lords which was at the time the highest court in the UK. And what happened in the House of Lords? Well there were two things that were particularly important by the time it got up to the House of Lords. One of them is this legitimate expectation point. Was there a legitimate expectation of consultation? Had it been breached? But another issue that was very important was whether the courts in this country actually had the power to review the decision at all because it was taken under the Prime Minister's prerogative powers. What are prerogative powers? Prerogative powers are quite an interesting, slightly unusual thing. So if we take a step back in time, we can put it quite crudely. If you think about before the Civil War, we often think of the monarch as having pretty much absolute power. Now, although technically that would not have been the case, we can use that as, as a good starting point. At this time, the monarch has very few statutory powers. These powers that they enjoy are mostly powers they simply have by dint of being the monarch. They are their prerogative powers, waging war, things like that. Now, over time, those prerogative powers, especially since the 1689 Bill of Rights, have gradually been abolished, put on a statutory footing by Parliament, which then has precedence over those prerogative powers, or transfers to the Crown, the, the, the government. Um, very, very few prerogative powers are still enjoyed by the monarch personally today. So over time then you've had these powers which have been diminished quite a bit but some of them are still exercised by the government. One of those at the time was the ability to regulate civil service which was vested here in the Prime Minister. Why would that prevent judicial review of the Prime Minister's decision? So the reason for this um, is to do with the nature of these powers and the kinds of matters they typically still regulate today. So it's accepted that if your power comes from an act of parliament, a statute, the exercise of that power is amenable to judicial review. That's not a problem. Parliament has said, this is your power, and the courts can say, well, OK, have you, have you actually acted within your powers? But prerogatives are different because prerogative powers often regulate very sensitive matters. Declarations of war, for example, the use of police in emergencies or armed forces in emergencies, international relations, diplomacy. These are things which are or have been regulated over time by prerogative powers. And the courts, um, definitely up until this case, tended to say, well, those matters aren't things that judges ought to get involved in. So what did the House of Lords say in this case as to whether or not they could judicially review the prerogative powers of the Prime Minister? Well, this is one of the reasons this case is a landmark case, because for the first time the court said there is no reason why, just because it's a prerogative common law power and not a statutory power, we cannot in principle review the lawfulness of a decision taken using the prerogative. Lord Fraser said that these are powers delegated to the government and they should be subject to judicial control to ensure that they are not exceeded. Lord Diplock maintained that there is no reason why simply because a decision-making power is derived from common law and not a statutory source, it should for that reason only be immune from judicial review. So the court have decided that they can judicially review the Prime Minister's decision, which then brings us on to this next question of whether she gave appropriate notice and the issues of national security. So what did they decide then? So this is again where the case, you've got to compartmentalise the case when you're thinking about this. There's two issues. There's um, you know, the, the use of the prerogative and the breach of the legitimate expectation and then there's this national security thing hovering in the background. So, in terms of the argument put forward by the CCSU, the court agreed that 
yes, they had a legitimate expectation of consultation and the Prime Minister had breached that. But ultimately, the CCSU claim was unsuccessful. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a Pyrrhic victory. The court said that given the national security implications put forward by the government, this is not a kind of decision which they would deem to be what we call justiciable. That this is the sort of decision that the courts do not think they should be getting too involved in. It's about national security and they felt the government was best placed to determine here whether national security would be compromised. So although on the one hand that, that there was a breach for legitimate expectation and we established this really good principle, important principle, that prerogative powers can be reviewed, there is then this other thing which is that prerogative powers can't be reviewed if the subject matter happens to be non-justiciable. The national security is a really good example of a non-justiciable situation. So if um, an issue or a decision is justiciable, on what grounds can a citizen bring a claim for judicial review? Absolutely. The good thing about this case as well is that Lord Diplock took the opportunity to try to summarise rather a lot of case law on judicial review. And he said at the time there are three grounds which you can bring a judicial review on. Illegality, irrationality, and a procedural impropriety such as the one in this case. And he added that in the future, it may be that proportionality becomes a ground of review. And indeed today, we use the ground of proportionality in Human Rights Act cases and in European Union law related cases. So, let's take a closer look at the grounds upon which the decision of a public body, whether it be a local authority, an NHS trust or even the office of the Prime Minister, can be subject to judicial review. First, illegality. This means that the public body must not act in a way that is ultra vires, or in other words, which exceeds the powers conferred on it. As Lord Diplock said, the decision maker must understand correctly the law that regulates his or her decision making power and must give effects to it. Secondly, irrationality. This refers to a decision that is irrational, unreasonable, or in Lord Diplock's words, so outrageous in its defiance of logic or of accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to the question could have arrived at the decision. And thirdly, procedural impropriety. This is where the decision maker has failed to observe the rules of natural justice. For example, that no man or woman may be a judge in his or her own cause, or that a person directly affected by a decision must be given the opportunity to state his or her case and to know and answer the decision maker's case. It means that decision makers have a duty to act fairly. Lord Diplock also suggested the possibility of an additional ground for judicial review, the principle of proportionality, which he said was recognised in the administrative law of several of our fellow members of the European Economic Community, as it was then. Proportionality remains a principle of what is now European Union law, and it's also used by the European Court of Human Rights. It demands that any action taken does not go beyond what is necessary to achieve its intended objectives. This has not to date been adopted as a separate ground for judicial review in the UK, but it is possible to bring a claim for judicial review on the basis that a decision was made in breach of the Human Rights Act 1998, which does use proportionality as the standard. Section 6.1 of the Act provides that it is unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with the Convention right. We can also use this in European Union law cases. <laughs> 